Welcome to No Rares Required, episode 22, March of the Machines, the new Magic the Gathering set that just dropped on Arena today. Usually I discuss a drafting strategy for a specific color pair or archetype, but today I will be covering my favorite commons and uncommons, going over the set's mechanics and what each archetype is trying to do in a broad sense. There is a lot going on in this set, especially with the included bonus sheet. There are a lot of cards to get familiar with, so let's get started. I usually start with my best common and move down the list, but today they'll just be the ones that caught my attention and the reasons why. So there's no reasoning to their order other than alphabetical. First up, we have Knight of the New Coalition. I think this is going to be a common that performs well because it is a decent stat block, a 4-4 four, four for 4 that is spread across two bodies. Both have Vigilance, and the archetype for Azorius or White-Blue is Knights, so the creature type is relevant. Also, as usual, White has a go-wide theme, wherever um, whether you're going to pump your creatures for plus 2, plus 1 with Inspired Charge, or if you are going to use the bodies to cast Convoke. Next up, we have a uh, Core Halberd, an artifact equipment for one white that gives equipped creature plus one plus one and vigilance with an equip cost of one. I generally like equipment that has an equip cost of one, and I'm wary of equipment with higher equipment costs. But what really sells me on this is the vigilance. One of the set's new card types is battles, which I think will play a lot like reverse planeswalkers. So being able to attack a battle while leaving up your defenses to defend your own battles I think will be important. Additionally, Vigilance allows you to attack and then cast a Convoke spell, so you don't lose tempo. Convoke is another mechanic of the set that allows you to tap a creature to lower the cost of the Convoke spell's casting cost. And that's it for the commons. Um, I, th I think one of the problems with white is that most of the power lies at the uncommon level, but what it lacks in commons it certainly makes up for at the uncommon level, bringing six that caught my attention. First up we have Invasion of Belanon and our first battle card. Battle cards enter the battlefield on your opponent's side, they have some sort of uh, enter the battlefield effect, and a set amount of toughness or defense. So you choose whether to attack the battle or your opponent, sort of like when a planeswalker is in play. Then once you have dealt enough damage, 5 in this case, the card flips. Before it flips though, Invasion of Belanon creates a 2-2 white and blue knight with vigilance. In general, I'm interested in battles that give relevant benefits without having to be flipped within a range of 1 additional mana. So, for example, with Invasion of Belanon, you're paying 3 for a 2-2, two, two, which would normally be around a cost of 2, so it passes the test. But take a look at the flipped side. Invasion of Belanon flips into Belanon War Anthem, giving all of your creatures plus 1, plus 1. Another thing to point out with battles is the cost of flipping the battle. You're going to have to make a judgment call on whether or not to flip it, or just hit your opponent's face. And there are cards like War Historian or War Trained Slasher that are specifically good at attacking battles that will make it a little less costly. But you will still have to do your best to evaluate your, your deck's strategy and the current board state and come to a decision. Decisions like this are what I think are going to differentiate the good from the bad players, and I love it from a game design perspective. But back to Belanon War Anthem. Anthems are strong cards in Limited, but the 5 defense is quite the cost. If you have the evasive creatures to flip this without trading too much value, and you are going wide enough to benefit off of the Anthem effect, I think it will be worth flipping. Next up we have Norn's Inquisitor and our next new mechanic, Incubate. Incubate X creates an incubator token with X plus one plus one counters on it. So Incubate 2 would be two plus one plus one counters. Then you can pay two colorless to transform it into an artifact creature. So for Norn's Inquisitor, you get a 1-1 one, one for two, which is not great, but you get a 2-2 two, two token. And then when that token becomes a creature, it becomes a 3-3 three, three because Norn's Inquisitor puts a plus one plus one counter on it whenever a permanent transforms into a Phyrexian. 
So you get a 4-4 four, for four, four across two bodies, which I like, and an additional plus one plus one on future transformations. I think this card will see the most play in Orsov, where the archetype is centered around Incubate. But even outside of that archetype, this card is doing enough to see play. Next up, we have Seal of Existence. If you are familiar with the set, you may have noticed that I did not include Realm Breaker's Grasp, the set's enchantment removal at, at common. I think this will be a set where the Disenchant, Sunder the Gateway in white, and Atraxa's Fall in green are both going to be included in the main deck. So in general, I'm going to avoid uh, encha enchantment removal. However, Seal from Existence has a very important line of text, which is Ward 3. So it will remove a non-land permanent at least until turn 5. Banishing light effects are almost always worth including in limited. The fact this exiles also gets pesky effects off of the board that Realm Breaker's Grasp leaves behind. And it can hit more than just creatures, and I think this is enough for me to actively want this card. Next up we have Sun Blessed Guardian and our third mechanic of the set which is Transform or Double-Faced Cards. The Double-Faced Cards tend to be not so great, but then flip into something interesting. Sunblessed Guardian is just a Grizzly Bear, a 2-2 two, two for 2, but it flips into Furnace Blessed Conqueror, a 3-3 three, three that whenever it attacks, you create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of it. It does take 5 and 1 red Phyrexian mana, which as a refresher means you can pay 2 life instead of tapping a red source, to um, make the 2 3 threes, and that's if you haven't added additional counters to this card before it flipped, since for every plus 1 plus 1 on it, the token also gets an additional plus 1 plus 1. You do have to sacrifice the token at the beginning of the next instep, but I generally like grizzly bears that do something later in the game, so I'll be picking these up. Also, I really like the transformation mechanic as well, because it leads to decisions about whether or not the card is worth flipping, and it helps mitigate drawing the later part of your curve early in the game. Next up, we have Surge of Salvation. I really liked cards like Sam uh, Tamiyo's Safekeeping in Neon Dynasty and Lauren's Escape in Brothers War. Cheap cards that can mitigate your opponent's interaction tend to be undervalued, in my opinion. Surge of Salvation gives you and all your permanents hexproof for one white, and if you happen to be up against Rakdos, this can be a hugely devastating play as all of your creatures collide with their board and take no damage. I'm guessing it's a pretty safe bet that I'll be including one of these in every deck with white. My last uncommon for white is Zalfer and Lancer. A 3-3 three, three for 3 is an okay starting uh, stat block, but if you have some knight synergy looking at you, Azorius, then it shouldn't be too hard to make this into a 4-4 four, four Vigilance, which is going to be a lot of early pressure for your opponent to answer. Now for blue. My first common is Assimilate Essence, and I might be a little higher on this card than most, I think this will play a lot like Essence Scatter from Dominaria United. It's a counterspell for two that can hit creatures or battle spells, unless your opponent pays four. Then, if they do, you get a 2-2 Incubator token out of it. If you happen to end up against blue-red or blue-black spells, then you might end up waiting for this card to find a target. But I do think every archetype will have battle spells that they want to play, so I don't think it will be a dead card very often, but there is a card at common that might prove to be a problem for it, and that is Eyes of Gytaxias. Mark my words, this will be one of the top commons in the set. A 3-3 three, three for 3 that draws a card. Sure, you have to pay 2 to make the 3-3 three, three into a creature, or, you know, use one of the many ways to transform your incubator tokens for free, like Omen Hawker or Attentive Skywarden. We'll see, but my gut says that this card will also be undervalued early on, and I look forward to grabbing multiples. Next up, we have Meeting of Minds, and our fourth mechanic of the set, Convoke. Convoke allows you to tap your creatures to lower the casting cost, and it can even remove colored mana from the casting cost as long as the creature is the matching color. Usually this type of card is reserved for the Spells Matter archetypes or control decks looking to outvalue your opponent. 
but uh, an instant draw two is great. And this is why I'm so high up on cards with vigilance. And I think this will see play in every blue archetype. Uh, you imagine a, a zero cost divination at the end of your opponent's turn is very appealing. Next up, we have Order of the Mirror, a 2 1 for 2 with the transform ability. And it flips into Order of the Alabaster Host. A 3 3 knight that whenever it becomes blocked, that creature gets minus 1 minus 1 until end of turn. And the best part is you can flip this on turn 3. And uh, because it's 3 and a Phyrexian white mana. And this is a lot of early pressure on your opponent. So a 2 power 2 drop that can turn into something better for a reasonable cost? Yes, please. Next up we have Preening Champion, a 2-2 two -two flyer for 3, also known as a Wind Drake that spawns a 1-1 one -one token. Convoke is an easy payoff for having multiple creatures, but even outside of that, I like cards that create multiple bodies, since if your opponent has removal, you still get value out of it. I also think that the evasion of flying is going to be handy in flipping battles. My last uncommon for a total of six is Zalfarin uh, Shapecraft. I've heard some claim that it is not on the same level as Suit Up from Neon Dynasty, but I like a two cost cantrip spell that can turn an unblocked 1 1 into four damage or remove a big chonker that took three damage. Maybe I'm too high on this, but I'll be looking for multiples, especially in the Convoke Spells Is It or Blue Red deck. Now for the blue uncommons. Captive Weird is a 1 cost 1 3 with Defender. And for 3 and a Phyrexian mana, it flips into Completed Conjurer. A 3 3 that when it transforms, exiles the top card of your library, which you can play until the end of your next turn. The end of your next turn is key, since it allows you to flip this on turn 3 without worrying about losing value. So a 1-3 one, for 1 that gives you a card draw for 3 later sounds an awful lot like Thraben Inspector, but with a 3-3 three, three body. I'm guessing this is going to play very well. Next up is Omen Hawker, and it's a great card to follow a transformation card. A one cost mana dork is great if you have enough cards with activated abilities, which there are plenty of in this set. The first thing that comes to mind is the incubator tokens that require two to transform, but there's also the double faced cards that transform as well, um, as well as equipment and the large cost creatures at common with land cycling, not to mention just cards with activated abilities. So there are plenty of things to spend this mana on, and if this isn't answered with early removal, your opponent will quickly fall behind. Next up we have Oracle of Tragedy, a 1-3 for 2 with a looting ability. 2 cost rummagers from previous sets like Scrapwork Mutt and Axiom Engraver were both top performers, since smoothing out your early plays is incredibly beneficial. And loot, where you draw before you discard instead of after, is better than rummage. The second option to shuffle your best four cards with mana value three or greater back into your library will happen less often, but late in the game, it might be just what you need. Skyclave Aerialist is a 2-1 flyer for two, which is a good stat block on its own. And for four and a green Phyrexian mana, you can flip this into Skyclave Invader, a 2-4 flyer that grabs you a card when you transform it. Not amazing, so I won't be in a hurry to flip this like some of the other transform cards, but good enough when you have the extra mana or are top decking against your opponent. Wicked Slumber is a 4 cost instant with Convoke that taps up to two target creatures. Then you get to choose how to distribute the stun counters. Do you want one on each, or do you want one to get a double dose? Stun counters are a neat addition that they brought in during Dominaria United. Even if they use a card to untap the stunned creature, it just removes a counter instead. And I've definitely seen people miss the fact, uh, this fact a couple of times. I also like that it is an instant, allowing you to cheaply cast this through Convoke at the end of your opponent's turn to set up a nice attack on your turn. 
My last uncommon for blue is Xerix Strobe Knight, a 2-2 flyer with Vigilance for 3, but it can tap to create a 2-2 knight token whenever you cast two or more spells in a turn. This includes creature spells, so putting three bodies on the board should be quite achievable, and Xerix fits especially well in the Azorius archetype, which is about knights, going wide, and convoke. Now for black. Aetherblade Agent is a 1-1 for 2 with Death Touch. Two-cost Death Touchers tend to make great blockers, if nothing else, but this one you can pay 4 and a blue Phyrexian mana to flip it into Gytaxian Mind Stinger, a 3-3 Death Touch that whenever it deals combat damage to a player or battle, you draw a card. Cards that draw when they deal damage need to be addressed quickly, or you quickly outvalue your opponent. They are also... There are also two Bite spells in green that pair quite well uh, with the Death Touch, Cosmic Hunter and, and Tandem Takedown. Bladed Battlefan is going to be a fun trick, especially early on in the set, when people don't think to play around it. Anyone remember Quick Draw Dagger from Streets of New Capenna? Pepperidge Farm remembers. For two mana, you get to give a creature plus one plus zero and Indestructible. So you, even, uh, you can even use this in response to removal. Then with the cheap equip, equip cost of 1, you can move this around to get in for a little bit of extra damage. Deadly Derision is a throwback to Grim Bounty in AFR, where it was absolutely busted. And it was a sorcery back then, so yeah, let's make it an instant. Seems fair. For two and a double pip black, you get to destroy target creature or planeswalker and create a treasure token. This treasure can help you ramp the following turn, or it makes an excellent artifact sacrifice fodder, which several cards can take advantage of in this set, like Final Flourish. Two cost, instant speed, give target creature minus two, minus two until end of turn. And if you pay the kicker, by sacrificing an, an artifact or creature, it becomes a whopping minus six, minus six until end of turn. This is enough to destroy many of the bombs in the set, and since it is instant speed, you don't even need the kicker for this to be good, and can use it as a combat trick. Now for the uncommons. Uh, Blight Reaper Thalid is a 2-2 two -two for two that transforms for three, and a green Phyrexian mana into... Light Sower Thalid, a 3-3 that spawns a 1-1 token when it transforms. It also creates a 1-1 when it dies. So a 5-5 worth of stats spread over 3 bodies for 5 mana and 2 life or 6 mana seems like a pretty good deal. Collective Nightmare is going to be a nightmare to play around. See what I did there? It's a 3 cost instant with Convoke that gives target creature minus 3 minus 3 until end of turn. All of the Convoke instants are going to make it hard to read what is in your opponent's hand, and a good reason to practice bluffing with full control. Completed Huntmaster is a 2 3 for 3 that allows you to pay 1 colorless, tap, and sacrifice another creature or artifact to create a 3 3 incubator token. I hope you can see why I'm low on enchantment removal. There seems to be plenty of 1-1s running around for the Convoke strategies, not to mention the treasure from Deadly Derision that can turn uh, this this can turn into a 3-3 Hill Giant. And uh, did I mention that Rakdos or Black Red's theme is sacrifice? So there's that synergy as well. Invasion of Eldraine is a Mind Rot for one additional mana, so for four you can make your opponent discard two cards. It passes the test of only costing one more mana, as long as making your opponent discard is something that you want to do. It's also a card to keep in your memory, since most people will keep an additional land in hand to play around Nizumi Informant, the 1-1 one, one common for two that makes your opponent discard a card, but not necessarily two. Then if you flip it, you get Prickle Fairies, a 2-2 flyer that hits, for, uh, hits them for two at the beginning of their upkeep if they have two or fewer cards in hand, which after discarding two, they probably will. Mizumi Freewheeler is a 3-3 menace for four, which is an acceptable stat block, and when it enters the battlefield, each player mills three cards. 
Then for five and a white Phyrexian mana, it transforms into Hideous Flesh Wheeler, a 4-5 menace that when it transforms, you put target permanent with mana value two or less from your graveyard, including your opponents, so sorry, a graveyard, onto the battlefield. I think the real combo wombo, though, isn't necessarily to flip it, but to take advantage of the self-mill. For example, you could pair this with Invasion of Torvada to fill your graveyard with tasty targets to reanimate in Orsov or Black-White, and uh, in Demir or Blue-Black to help get the eight cards in the graveyard. There's enough synergy in the set if I'm looking to dirtle for late-game value out of my graveyard, and I'll take the Menace if I'm on the beatdown. Phyrexian Gargantuan seems like a pretty good top-end to me. A 4-4 four, for four, 4, double pit black is a bit on the expensive side, but draw 2 for 2 life is great at outvaluing your opponent, which is generally what you want to be doing on turn 6 and onward. My last black uncommon is Scornblade Berserker. It's, all, it's also the first example of the last mechanic of the set, which is backup. Backup X uh, lets you put plus X plus X on a target creature, and it gains the ability of the backup card until end of turn. So Scorn Blade Berserker gives a creature the ability to sacrifice to draw a card, and is another reason to not feel great about enchantment removal. I might be ranking this card a little too highly, but for one, I think this opens up some interesting lines that help you transition from surviving the early game into finding your late game bombs. It also works well enough as a sacrifice outlet or fodder uh, if you find yourself in Rakdos. Now for red. Thrashing Frontliner is a 2-2 trampler for two that gets plus one plus one until end of turn whenever it attacks a battle. Red is the most interested in battles and the most equipped to flip them, so this fits right in. The fact it has trample goes well with combat tricks, and I think it makes an above par grizzly bear. Volcanic Spite is the best red removal at common. For two, you deal three damage to target creature, planeswalker, or battle. Then you can put a card on the bottom of your library to draw a card. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's a reprint of Fiery Prof or Fire Prophecy from Ikoria, which was one of the best cards in red, at least at common. And this one hits Planeswalkers and Battles. The Rummage effect is particularly nice at 2 mana to help smooth your curve, and the 3 damage means that this can trade up in value as well. Or you can use it to trade in the land you've been holding to play around your opponent's discard effects. Rin's Resolve is my last common for red. For two, at sorcery speed, you exile the top two cards of your library, and you get to play them until the end of your next turn. It's a reprint of Reckless Impulse from Vow, which was a very commonly misplayed card. You don't want to play this on turn two. You, like, you really don't want to play this on turn two. This is for when you are in a top deck against your opponent, and it requires that you take inventory of what cards you can hit before you cast this spell. I especially like this card in combination with Urbrask, or really any of the cards that aim to play multiple spells in a turn. Now for the red uncommons. Kenra's Spellspear is a 2-2 Trample Prowess for 2. If that wasn't good enough, you can pay 3 and a Phyrexian blue mana to transform it into Gytaxian Spellstalker, a 3-3, board 2, double prowess. I'll point out that cards that transform can immediately attack as long as the previous version was played the turn before. So yeah, I think this is the mythic level uncommon for the set. Double prowess is a beating, and it has trample, so you can't even chump block it. And then they gave it Ward 2, so you can't even use early removal on it. Seems like a fair and balanced card in. Next up, we have Shivan Branch Burner, a 5 double pip red 4 4 flyer with haste. Luckily, it has Convoke. You still need a fair amount, uh, or fair number of creatures to make this worth it, but in a deck that aims to create a bunch of 1 1s for Convoke spells, this is a nice late game threat, and I think it will fit quite nicely in Is It or Blue Red. 
speaking of Convoke spells, Stoke the Flames might be the best removal in red. It's going to be close, though, with Volcanic Spite. Two and double pip red to cast an instant that deals four damage to any target, and it has Convoke. The fact that this can hit face is going to win some games. That's it for the uncommons and commons in red that caught my attention. A rather short list. Now for green. Cosmic Hunger, a two-cost bite spell at common, and it hits creatures, planeswalkers, or battles. I also noticed in the flavor text that those damn Phyrexians got coma. And we didn't even get a card that we could play. We better see something in the aftermath set. Overgrown Pest is a 2-2 for 3 that when it enters the battlefield, you get to look at the top 5 cards of your library and put a land or double-faced card into your hand. We just came out of Phyrexia All Will Be One, where the top performing common was Contagious Vorak, which was very similar to this. It's a 2-2 instead of a 3-3, but battles as well as the cards that transform are all double-faced cards, and finding your 4th or 5th land proved to be a very beneficial option in 1. I'm going to say that this will also be a top-performing common. Portent Tracker stood out to me. Um, I like 2-mana rampers, especially when they do something later in the game, after you've ramped your, out your hand. So you can tap it to untap a target land. Uh, it's important to note here that it's a ramper, not a fixer. And then later you can tap it to deal one damage to a battle or repair a battle for one that you are defending. Timberland Ancient. Um, I think the big curve toppers with land cycling are at least filler. Uh, better than filler if you're splashing. But Timberland Ancient is a cut above the rest. A 6-5 Reach Trampler for 4 with a double pip green um, and uh, with 4 cycling. These land cyclers are great if you're splashing and count, I think, for one of the 4 sources you need for a splash of 1-3. to three. But this guy is decent just as is. Reach and Trample is a nice combination of keywords since it plays well on both defense and offense. My last green common is War Historian, and we can see why Gruul is all about flipping battles. A 3-3 reach for 3 is a good enough stat block for me to play it, but it also gets indestructible if it attacked a battle. There are also several Wind Drakes, or 2-2 Flyers, that I think we'll see play in this set. So this lines up nicely against those as well. Now for the uncommons. Notvold Hermit is a 4-4 for 4 which is kind of the modern-day hill giant, but for 5 and a blue Phyrexian mana, it transforms into Chrome Host Hulk. A 5-5, five five, whenever it attacks, up to one other target creature has base power and toughness 5-5 five five until end of turn. This is especially nice in Simic and Golgari, which aim to have a bunch of incubation tokens lying around that have a base power and toughness of 0-0. Zero zero. Ravenous Sailback is a 3-4 for 5 that when it enters the battlefield, you either give it haste, which you'll be very sad to do, or you can destroy an artifact or enchantment. I think there are going to be enough targets around with the Phyrexian Incubator tokens that this won't be much of a struggle to find a, a target, and it is yet another reason to be down on enchantment removal. Streetwise Negotiator is going to be misread. This is functionally a 3-3 three, three for 2. It just doesn't bite very well. Streetwise Negotiator is a 0-2 for 2 with backup 1, but it assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. It's not even limited to combat damage to creatures specifically or anything. So as long as you put the counter on it, this is just straight up a 3-3 three, three for 2. So yes please. Tandem Takedown is a bite spell for one and double pip green that uses two of your creatures at once. You'd think flavor-wise it would have to use two, but it is up to two target creatures you control. Each get plus one plus zero until end of turn, and then they deal damage equal to their power to target creature, planeswalker, or battle. This is quite nice since the downside to bite is your opponent casting removal to get a two for one, but with Tandem Takedown, there's a chance that you'll still kill your target. It can also hit Planeswalkers and Battles. This is definitely the best removal green has, so I'll be taking it early. 
Whew, we made it. Now for the artifacts, and there is but one that stood out to me. Flywheel Racer. It is a 3-2 artifact vehicle with crew 1 and Vigilance that can tap for one mana of any color if it is a creature. So if you're going to splash, which I think is likely, looking at the power level of the multicolored multi cards, um, you're going to want at least one copy of Flywheel Racer. And the fact that it has Vigilance makes it so that you can attack before tapping for mana if the circumstance allows for it. All right, now for the moment we've all been waiting for, the busted multicolor cards. Botanical Brawler is a 2-2 Trampler for two that whenever a plus one plus one counter is put on to another permanent you control, if it's the first time for that permanent this turn, you also put a plus one plus one on Botanical Brawler. The Celestia archetype is all about counters, so this fits right in. Elvish Vat Keeper is a 3-3 three, three for 3 that when it enters the battlefield creates a 2-2 two, two incubator token. Then it can tap for 5 and transform an incubator token while doubling the number of plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. The Golgari archetype is all about incubation, so this also fits quite nicely. I think the 5 on the activated ability is a bit expensive, but if you have the extra mana, why not? Halo Forger is a 3-1 flyer for 3 that when it enters the battlefield you pay X to cast a target or instant from a graveyard, including your opponents, without paying its mana cost. The, uh, the Demir archetype is graveyard spells, and many of its cards mill yourself as well as your opponent, so you should have plenty of spells to choose from. And of all the multicolored signpost uncommons, I think Halo Forger is the most powerful. Joyful Storm Sculptor is a 2 3 for 5, but it creates two 1 1 tokens when it enters the battlefield. And then whenever you cast a spell that has Convoke, it deals 1 damage to each opponent in each battle that they protect. The Is It archetype is Convoke Spells, so this card fits right in with that strategy. Marshal of Zalfir is a 2 2 knight for 2 that gives other knights you control plus 1 plus 1. It also has the ability to tap for a blue and a white to tap another target creature. The Azorius archetype is knights, so this fits right in. Also, the problem with lords is you usually can't attack with them or else you risk losing your lord, but this tap ability solves that problem. Mirror Shield Hoplite is a 2 2 vigilance for 2. Whenever a creature you control becomes the target of a backup ability, copy that ability. You may choose new targets for the copy. This ability triggers only once each turn. The Boros archetype is backup, so being able to double your counters and abilities is great. Mutagen Connoisseur is a 0 5 vigilance flyer for 3, and it gets plus 1 plus 0 for each transformed permanent you control. The Simic archetype is Transformation, which lends itself into the Phyrexian Incubator Tokens strategy, since they transform as well. This one is a little unimpressive at first, but once you start transforming those cards, it should apply plenty of damage. Rampaging Geoderm is a 3-3 Haste Trampler for 4, that whenever you attack, target attacking creature gets plus one plus one until end of turn and if it's attacking a battle it gets a plus one plus one counter on it instead so this can sit back and pump a different attacking creature like war historian or thrashing frontliner uh, or it can attack in itself the gruel archetype is all about flipping battles and this card will help you do just that Sculpted Perfection is a 4-cost enchantment that creates a 2-2 incubator token when it enters the battlefield. It is also a Phyrexian Anthem, giving all of your Phyrexians plus 1 plus 1. The Orsov archetype is all about Phyrexians, so as long as more than half of your deck is Phyrexian, this will be an easy inclusion. Last but not least, we have Stormclaw Rager, which is a 2-2 for 3 that can tap a colorless to sacrifice another creature or artifact to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Stormclaw Rager and draw a card. Sadly, it can only be activated at sorcery speed, and really this would be the 
awesome if it was instant speed because using this sort of response to uh, in response to removal is the dream. But the Rakdos archetype is all about sacrifice, so this will be right at home. Usually that would be the end of the overview, but they went and included a bunch of uncommon battles that are also worth a mention. I'm going to leave you to fend for your own when it comes to the 60 plus bonus sheet cards that they threw at us as well, because I'm just running out of time. And I've already put a fair amount of hours into making this uh, guide. So good luck. <laughs> Invasion of Amonkhet costs three mana and causes each player to mill three cards. Then uh, your opponents discard a card and you draw a card. This is on theme with what Demir wants to do, which is fill the graveyard. And then after you get through the four defense, it flips into... Lazotep Converter, or Convert, Convert. A 4 4 that enters as a copy of any creature in a graveyard, including your opponents, except it is a 4 4 black zombie. So imagine if you milled Elish Norn, or, you know, any of the other bombs in the set. Invasion of Ergamon lets you create a treasure token, then rummage a card for two mana. It then has a whopping 5 defense and flips into Truka Cliff Charger, a somewhat underwhelming 3-4 Trampler um, that lets you discard a card to find a land or a battle card. At least Gruul is all about flipping battles, so hopefully that can lower the cost of the high defense, but the front of the card is why I think it makes the cut. Invasion of Moag was worth a mention. When it enters the battlefield, you get to put a plus one plus one counter on each creature that you control. Then at, uh, after five defense, it flips to Bloom Wielder Dryads, a 3-3 three, three ward 2 that at the beginning of your instep, it puts a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. So it's a beefed up Luminarch Aspirant with ward uh, and I think is probably worth getting um, just to snowball the game even further. Invasion of New Capenna allows you to sacrifice an artifact or a creature to exile target artifact or creature and opponent controls for two mana. Since the Orsov archetype should have plenty of incubator tokens lying around, this is a, a great trade and yet another reason to be down on enchantment removal. And for t uh, for toughness, it flips into the Holy Frazzle Cannon, <laughs> an artifact equipment with an equip cost of one that whenever the equipped creature attacks, put a plus one plus one counter on that uh, creature and each creature that shares a creature type with it. Since your deck should be mostly Phyrexians and Orsov, this is worth flipping. Invasion of Pyrulia lets you scry three, then reveal a card and draw it if it is a land or a double-faced card. Generally, I'd rather be developing the board on turn two rather than scrying, so I'll be planning on playing this later, where I can immediately get through the four defense to flip it into Gargantuan Slabhorn, a 4-4 trample with ward two that gives other transformed permanents trample and ward two. Not game winning, but Simic should have plenty of transformed creatures that can benefit from the trample and going over the top of your opponent's defenses. Invasion of Xerix bounces a target creature to its owner's hand for four. Not a very impressive front side, but after you get through the four toughness, it flips into Vertex Paladin, a star star flyer with power and toughness equal to the number of creatures you control. Since Azorius is all about knights and very creature focused, this should be a massive flyer, and the bounce on the front side should help in flipping this immediately. For my closing remarks, I'll give you my ranking of the colors, blue, black, green, white, then red. Blue is a very deep color with plenty of interesting commons and uncommons, however I think it will often be a support color because it doesn't have a great selection of two drops. It does have the aggressive knight strategy of Azorius, the creation of incubation tokens for Simic, 
the milling strategy of Demir, and some great Convoke spells for Izzet. Black is also a very deep color, though it leans a little bit more on the uncommons and is filled with plenty of removal and sacrifice effects. Its biggest weakness is that it seems to be missing a little bit of early pressure. Green has plenty of top end and some very questionable ramp. <laughs> the mana fixing that I'm most interested in comes from land cycling cards and colorless sources, so it won't even be necessary to be base green when going for five color soup. It does have the second most amount of commons that I'm interested in, so I'll probably end up there fairly often. White is great, especially for early pressure with plenty of cheap early drops. Um, why do I have it as the fourth worst archetype then? Well, it only has two commons that I'm really interested in. I think most of its true power will be at the uncommon level, which means it won't support many pe players at the table, at least as the main color. It does have a fair amount of synergy with other archetypes, and Angelic Intervention is going to make combat decisions very difficult. If it had more interesting commons, I'd probably rank it higher. Then last but not least, well sort of least, <laughs> is Red. As usual, um, Red has a good selection of burn spells and is the best color for flipping battles. If the set is all about flipping battles, and it very well could be, then it's unfair to put red as the worst archetype. But with only six cards, which is half as many as blue, that really grabbed my interest at the common and uncommon level, I'm guessing my drafting preference will be elsewhere. Last, I will leave you with my thoughts on mana fixing. I think given the apparent power level of the multicolor cards, splashing is going to be very tempting especially since outside of Azorius Knights, things to be, seem to be on a slower pace than Phyrexia All Will Be One. We get 10 tap lands that are going to be great for splashing, Skittering Surveyor, the 1-2 for 3 color list that lets you search your deck for a land, uh, looks really good, Flywheel Racer, the artifact vehicle from earlier in the guide, as well as the Chonky Creatures with Land Cycling. Those would be my picks for fixing. Next week, I'll be diving into one of the archetypes in greater detail after I've had a chance to play the set. Speaking of, please take a moment to hit like and subscribe. It really helps me out, and maybe one day I can even get early access. Thank you all for enjoying my guide to March of the Machines, and thank you all for the support. I'll see you next week.